Well, hello and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, today we're going to finish up the Antarctic episode and have a look at the mechanics of sunrise and sunset and the general flat earth approach to science. So let's cue up the music and get going. Regardless of my own personal preferences of uh, levels of sanity with respect to fun things, it's a serious problem when you look and you, it's not like they say. Like, why with all these satellites, with all, with airplanes, you just take an aerial photo of it and paste it on there. It seems to be what they did with the rest of Google Earth, but that's, well, it's not a problem. But you don't really have to go all the way to Antarctica. Just go to the tip of South America, like this town where people live. Or don't even go there. Just look up times of sunrise and sunset on the internet. In mid-December, sunrise is earlier than 5 a.m. and sunset is later than 10 p.m. You know, I've pointed this out before and I don't think Dave did, so I'm going to kind of supplement Dave's information a little bit with this. Here's the sun. On December 15th, it rises at 4.49 a.m. But notice that it rises at a bearing of 135 degrees. That is south of 90 degrees. And when it sets at 10.06 p.m., it sets at 225 degrees. Again, that is south of west. Yet at this time, the sun is up north of this town by the Tropic of Capricorn. So how does the sun rise and set south of an east-west line? Can't really figure that out on a flat earth map, now can you? Now take your little model for the seasons and make it show night and day. Then try and make the night and day portions match up with these sunrise and sunset times. Demonstrate the light from the sun illuminating this location for more than 70% of its trajectory. And as you do that, make sure that it does not illuminate Point Barrow, Alaska whatsoever during its entire trajectory, as that town has endless night during this time of the year. That's right, lots of sun over here and zero sun over here. Good luck. If you decide to even try, observe that the light patterns become so nonsensical that not even the most meth-fueled creatives amongst you could vomit enough magnetism jargon to justify it. Well, okay. Uh, let's see, you challenged about how could it illuminate like that. Well, if you consider the fact that the atmosphere isn't perfectly clear, if the atmosphere is somewhat translucent, then it's pretty easy to understand that a point source of light with a reflective bowl or ring or dome around and above it that reflects the light, that that could conceivably illuminate around the outside. Now here's the basic intellectual dishonesty that's being promoted here. Do you notice where he's got the sun? Way out here, almost at the rim, just to try and generate this little dark spot here in the middle. And notice that that dark spot is not directly in the center of the circle. So if this is Point Barrow, Alaska, as the Earth rotated, all this area here would be at the exact same latitude as Point Barrow, Alaska. And even though in reality it's just as dark as Point Barrow, Alaska is, he's got this little dot right here. But he deliberately created that by moving the sun all the way out to the rim instead of over here, by the Tropic of Capricorn. Now the next thing that he's going to do is, remember his word salad nonsense about how the outer ice wall is somehow like a fiber optic fiber? Now how would that work? If the sun was over here and the fiber optics were lit up all the way around the rim, how far would that light extend inward? And if it extends inward all the way up to here, from this side, why would it suddenly stop here? And for that matter, why would it stop here? So, once again, he has no idea what he's trying to spew out. He's just trying to answer a question with a question and make this assertion without any evidence, saying it could be tested by an experiment, but I haven't bothered testing it, and dismissing the entire problem. 
It doesn't work that way, Sonny. Bowl or ring or dome around and above it that reflects the light that that could conceivably illuminate around the outside, maybe then there's a solution. Now, could that be done by experiment? Yes. Now, notice that even though he wants to say that, well, an experiment could prove this, he's assuming that that experiment would be in his favor to begin with and is immediately going on to something else. Well, show me an experiment where you have a rotating ball attracting water to its external surface or some nonsense. Notice how he tries to deflect from the question and the fact that he's on the hot seat. Show me how this is going to work. That's a simple question. Do an experiment. Well, no, I don't want to do the experiment. I'm just going to assume it's going to turn out my way. And I'm going to, in turn, challenge you to do an experiment that I know can't be done. This is not addressing the question. This is trying to deflect the question when you're put on the spot. And this is a classic flat earth move. Doesn't work on me. Answer the question that was originally put to you. How do you get light around to the other side of the world without illuminating Point Barrow, Alaska? If you say that there's an experiment that can be done, go right ahead and do it. I did. Doesn't work that way, Chief. Can a floating ball in space, it's spinning like a top, they say, but it's, it's tilted. The axis of rotation does not match the axis of revolution. The axis of revolution would be up and down, because there is an up and down even in space. In our solar system, there's an up and down. Well, as amusing as this is, let me just go ahead and put the brakes on it real quick. First, there is no up and down in space. There's no preferred direction. That's been established. That's not in question. Second of all, why do you have a problem with an axial tilt? Do you have some math to back that up that says that that can't happen somehow? Do other planets that we can readily observe have an axial tilt? Do other planets rotate in reference to their ecliptic planes around the sun? That's our experiments. We can see other objects in the sky that do exactly the same thing that the Earth is doing. You know, and like the tape measure to the sun, the only reason that they bring this up is they know that an object large enough to have its own gravity cannot be created on the Earth. It would be hundreds of miles in diameter. We can study asteroids, we can study other planets and moons, but we can't build a laboratory that has an object that large in it to test some of these things, and then how would we isolate that object from the gravity of the larger Earth? You know, what they do is they put requirements on it, like taking a tape measure to the sun, that are knight's errands that cannot be done. They are impossible to be done. Yet, that's what they claim they have to have in order to believe anything other than their narrative. That's not skepticism, and that's not science. You have this tilted axis of rotation and this revolution around another axis Demonstrate that in experiment, please. I want to see it. I want to see how that works. Now, that would explain the seasons by the heliocentric model somewhat. The seasons are easy enough to explain on the heliocentric model with a classroom globe. That's why classrooms have globes, to teach these things. Okay? So what we had in this episode was a question that the author of this video simply could not answer. What we're looking at is basically the way the Flat Earth tries to dance and redirect and misdirect when confronted with very hard questions. There is no way on a Flat Earth model to explain the movements of the sun in 24-hour darkness at the poles or 24-hour sunlight at the poles. Now, the reason for that is that the geometry certainly wouldn't match, and they don't have a model to begin with. So unless they can come up with an actual working model of the flat Earth, which so far they have failed to do, that would allow the geometry to occur that would account for 24-hour sunlight at the South Pole and 24-hour darkness at the North Pole, they're really stuck, and they know that. So what they try and do is they try and come up with some sort of a silly ad hoc word salad like 
fiber optic transmission through the ice to light up the other side of the earth, but leave the center by the pole in darkness. And then they immediately jump to asking another question on an unrelated subject. Well, how do you explain rotation about an axial tilt that's different than the orbital ecliptic? Okay, well, A, I don't really know that they even understand what that term means. And B, what does that have to do with the question that we asked you? So when you can't answer a question in the flat earth, you simply ask a question on a different subject to try and confuse people. They don't confuse me and I don't buy that. Answer the question that was put to you. But in the meantime, thank you very much for stopping by. In our next episode in a couple of days, we're going to go over making predictions based on the non-existent flat earth model. Eclipses, positions of planets, etc. Your choice but you have to use the Flat Earth model to make those predictions. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by, and make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there. Love to have you on Team Bob, and hit the bell icon so you know when new videos come out.